Sabbath and welcome to our church family. We're so glad you could join us today, either in person or by joining online. We're honored to share this day with you as we worship God's risen son. We hope that God has blessed, you, blessed your life. Um, a couple announcements. There is an elders meeting that will take place on Monday, September 7 at 8.15 p.m. in the GCA cafeteria after the fall week of prayer. A Zoom link will be provided for those who cannot attend in person. GCA fall week of prayer starts September 7 to September 12th. Meetings will be streamed online at live, will be streamed online live at gcasda.org starting at 7 p.m. and ending, oh, hang on, and 7.30 on Friday. Evening will be ending at yeah, so it'll conclude next Sabbath during the church service at 11 a.m. Um, the guest speaker is June Price, former pastor and chaplain at Andrews University, and the church office will be closed on Monday, September 7th. Also, this afternoon, if any of you are free during 2 p.m., there will be a hike to Key One Falls. Um, I guess that's... Yeah, cool. Good morning. Uh, before I even moved here, I kept hearing about the new people that were going to be in the community. And one person that I kept hearing about over and over again was the new principal at Coble Elementary School. And everyone kept saying, you're going to be so excited to find out about our new leadership at Coble and when you get a chance to meet Mrs. Helbley. And so I thought, now that Mrs. Helbley's here and she is well established, You've been doing this for a little bit now, a full month over at Coble. I thought I'd give us all a chance to spend a little bit of time getting better acquainted. So this is our new principal at the Coble Elementary School, Mrs. Helbley, or Rebecca Helbley. Once you, have a, once you have a kid in elementary school, you realize no matter how old you turn, you can never call them anything else but Mrs. and Mr. It just becomes kind of a natural thing. So Mrs. Helbley, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, my name is, my first name is Rebecca. And I have a husband named Clint, who is a firefighter. And I have two boys. One you might see in the cafeteria. His name is Hunter Helbley. He's the redhead. Yeah, there he is. Then my other son is Gavin. He's kind of hiding out back there. He's in sixth grade. And we've really enjoyed transitioning to the Calhoun community. And so we're really glad to be here and excited to join you. Now, one thing, when you're in the Adventist work world, a message that I've heard over and over again is that the hardest job in Adventist employment is being a principal. So tell us, what is it that keeps you as a principal? Why do you do this? What do you like about your job? Because it's challenging. It is. God really gives me an opportunity. I get a ringside seat to see how he works in people's lives. And now that I'm I've been doing this for 20 years. I have seen so many kids. In fact, I see some of my kids out in this building today that it's so neat to see you guys grow up, to see you accept Jesus, to see you continue to minister as adults. And I'm just so blessed that I can count as my former students entrepreneurs and lawyers and doctors and pastors and teachers and to see them make a difference around the world. I'll, I'll just brag on one of my students, which I think we actually know in common, um, the little fidget cube people, right? Yeah. I got to teach the people that invented the fidget cube when they were in um, ninth and 10th grade. And so I just think it's so cool to see you guys make a difference in the world and such a blessing in my own life to see how God blesses you. Very cool. Now, one thing I'm thinking also when I look out here, there are some kids that we have that are pre-elementary right now. Um, some of these older kids, one day you might end up in this area with kids. What is it that makes Coble so special? Wow, when I first started to visit Coble, I just noticed this incredible community feeling. And they share one major um, thing in common, and that is a love for Jesus. And I think when we come together as a community focused on showing his love to others, it provides a really special environment to grow up in, and it brings us closer. When you're able to build your early life around what God wants you to do, God continues to bless you 
for your entire life. And so it's really neat that we get to work together in a community that shares the value of Jesus and his love. That's awesome. Last question. This is a different year for any school across the nation, even the world. How are things going this year? Like, what has the start been like? It's what? We're week, just week finished four. week four. Okay. Yep. Wow. You know, God has blessed our community in ways that I can't even imagine. Or if you had asked me of three, four months ago, I wasn't sure if school was going to start. I was just really, really concerned because even things, getting things like Clorox wipes were impossible. And I have about a $5,000 order of Clorox wipes coming in on Tuesday. So the, just those sort of miracles that God works out on our behalf, he's walking ahead of us. And school has opened. We have had a month of health. Our students and our faculty are still healthy. And that is only due to God's blessing and continued protection of our community. And you know, because he, we trust him to take care of our health, now we get to focus on academics. And so it's really a special opportunity to, to, to continue growing both academically and physically and spiritually together. I don't know. Did I answer the question? I think so. I think so. <laughs> we, are, we are so excited. As a parent who has kids over there, we are super excited about Rebecca's leadership. Can we just show her our appreciation? Who would have ever thought $5,000 in Clorox wipes would be a purchase you'd ever make? Um, thank you for your leadership, and enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Look at all those wonderful smiling faces out there. to see me this I read. and in my heart I find a need of him to be my savior that he would leave his place on high and come for sinful men to die you count it strange so once did I My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. Just live and die and let me breathe. My strength, my solace from this spring That he who lives to be my king Wants that to be my savior That he would leave his place on high And come for sinful men to die and it's strange, so once did I Before I knew my Savior My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me My God, He was, my God, He is My God is always gonna be My Savior loves, my Savior
My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God he was, my God he is, my God is always going to be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God he was, my God he is, my God is always going to be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. It is now time for the kids to come up for children's story. We are not collecting the lamb's offering, as you know. And children, you can bring your masks on and you can sit down in one of the squares. If you would like to give to the lamb's offering, which you know is incredibly important to our students, we have a place out back for you to do that when you leave. Students, you can come on down. You can sit on a square. You can sit with your siblings, but you don't have to. We had some rivalry in my house last time over that. So you can sit with your siblings, but you don't have to. Come on down, kids. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys doing today? You good? You're good? So today I'm going to be telling you a story that my dad actually told me when I was about you guys' age. This story, it takes place a long time ago, kind of somewhere near here. It's hot, humid, you know, it's a small town. And so one day there was this man, he was a very poor man. He was walking through the town trying to find a job, knocking on doors, asking people for a job. And so He's going, he, no one's giving him a job, nobody, everybody's just slamming the door in his face. And so he starts walking out of town, it's late in the day, and he comes across this huge white house, I mean a huge house. So he goes up to the door, he's like, it couldn't hurt to try to knock on the door. So he knocks on the door, he's like, boom, boom, boom. So this guy opens the door, it's a butler, you know, they're always named Alfred, right? They're always named Alfred. So Alfred opens the door, he's like, good evening, sir, how can I help you? And so the guy, he's like, hey, I need a job. I really need a job. I'm really poor. I'm trying to feed my family. And so the butler goes back inside of the house. He goes and grabs the owner. His name is Mr. Williams. So Mr. Williams comes out. He says, you know, what would you like, sir? He says, I need a, really need a job for my family. And so he brings um, the guy into the house and he says, you see this field out back? I want you to go up and down and just plow this field. There's an ox over there and we have a plow and I just want you to plow the field. It should take you about three days and so I want you to come back tomorrow and get started. And so the guy says, thank you so much. You know, I'm so happy you gave me a job and I'll be back tomorrow. So he comes back the next day and he gets to work. You know, he's, he's got the ox and got the plow. He's pushing in the oxes, you know, it's going along, going up, turn around, come back down, going up, turn around, come back down. And it's getting very boring. And so he realized, man, it's really hot and I'm very tired. So he stops what he's doing. He goes onto this hill and sits under a tree and he goes to sleep and takes a nice nap. You guys like taking naps? Yeah. And so he wakes up from this nap and he looks at the field and realizes, hey, half of the field is done. Who did this? And he looks out onto the field and he sees the ox just still going by itself up and down and up and down. And he realizes, I don't need to help the ox. The ox can do it on its own. And so he's, he's thinking to himself, hey, man, all I have to do is sit here, and I can go get this money and feed my family. And so he sits, and he realizes, you know, this may not be as much work as I thought. And so he goes to sleep, and then the next day he comes back and sits under the tree again. But this time he sings a little song. He goes, you think I'm working, but I ain't. You think I'm working, but I ain't. You think I'm working, you think I'm working, you think I'm working, but I ain't. And so he keeps singing this song and he goes to sleep and he's just like, you know, it's going to be a great time. So he wakes up and sure enough, the field's done. So he runs back up to the house. He's like, 
hey, I finished the field. I finished it. I finished it. And so Alfred goes and gets Mr. Williams. He says, are you done? How do you think you did? Was it hard? He says, no, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be, you know, but I did my best. And so, you know, Mr. Williams goes back into the house and he comes back and, you know, the guy's thinking, oh, I'm getting ready to get paid. This is going to be great. Mr. Williams comes back. He says, you think I'm paying, but I ain't. You think I'm paying, but I ain't. You think I'm paying, you think I'm paying, you think I'm paying, but I ain't. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. How did you know? And Mr. Williams says, I saw you sitting under that tree and sleeping. And I saw the ox going up and down and up and down. And he realizes, wow, he caught me. And so this can sometimes be like our relationship with God. We go to church and go to Sabbath school, and sometimes we're just going through the motions and not really working our hardest. But what God wants us to do, he wants us to sit on the plow and keep going and up and down and up and down and try and grow our relationship with him. And so when you guys are coming to church and doing all that, we want you to grow your relationship and pray and talk to your parents and do that kind of thing to grow your relationship with God. So that's the story, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to get up this morning, be able to come to church and learn more about you. Please allow us to not just go through the motions, but to actually grow our relationship with you. Please forgive us of our sins and save us when you come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You guys can go back to your seats now.
Let us pray. Lord, you are our good, good Father. Lord, be with us in this place as we worship you. Listen to our prayer requests. You know what they are. Be with us as we sing your glory. Be with Pastor David as he preaches. Let his words be yours and not his. Be with, be with us the rest of this day. In your name, amen. Good morning. Are you guys missing the seniors for those of you that are GCA? <laughs> I was going to report to them this afternoon like how you guys were just crying about their absence, but you don't look that disappointed. I won't tell them your actual response. Um, I want to talk about the internet for a second. The internet is one of these things that has given us a lot of blessings. There's a lot of great things about the internet, a lot of things that we appreciate, a lot of things where it feels like you couldn't possibly survive without it if you didn't have it now that we have it. However, there are some things, some curses that it has brought, one of which is that it has been an endless source of inspiration to people who would have been better off not being inspired. And, and one of the areas that I'm thinking about is when it comes to pictures. Because we live in a day and age where you can browse online and get all kinds of inspiration about a beautiful picture that you can take. And previously, you, some of you, most of you are too young to realize this, but previously there was a day and age where we didn't have sophisticated cameras, most of us, and we didn't have a lot of great inspiration. And so we just kind of left it to the professionals. And we're like, the professionals, they do their thing, and then we just sort of take these ugly little snapshot pictures. But now, the internet's there, and we all carry sophisticated cameras, and so we think we can do some amazing things, and we can take incredible shots like we've seen before. The other thing is, is when you have this tendency, and you mix it with having a baby, let me tell you. Once a couple has a baby, immediately they want to document everything. And so you see this more than anywhere else with babies. And so I went scouring the internet to show you some examples of what I mean. Exhibit A. Um, exhibit A is you get this idea of cute little baby on the left, and then you attempt to replicate it. It doesn't work. In fact, maybe you should call CPS because that doesn't look really safe for that baby, right? Or next picture, another example of this. The cute little sheepskin bear rug picture. Yeah, that's not going to be as cute as you think it's going to look. Or finally, this one right here. I'm not sure how much you can see, but if you look really closely at the bottom one, there's a little bit of spit up coming up <laughs> right on the back of the sibling. Because we look at these pictures and we think, oh, this is going to make an adorable picture. I want to do this at home. And it just never works. Well, I'm embarrassed to say, I have to admit that I have succumbed to this as well. Like, I've had my own issues. I remember when our oldest, Jocelyn, was born, we had all kinds of ideas of great shots that we wanted to get. Because we have a good camera, right? Like, why don't we take a nice picture? And I remember there was inspiration from all the family members because we're all crowded together. The baby's just been born. We're at home. We're getting lots of pictures. And everyone's throwing out ideas of different pictures they've seen in the past that worked really well. And we want to try to do that too. And so I don't know what picture was the actual inspiration, but I'll show you an example of one that people saw and they thought, oh, this would look nice. And so we did this picture here. That's not my feet, by the way. This is the example of what we wanted to see. Like, oh, wouldn't it be precious if like Valerie and you and baby Jocelyn lined up and stuck your feet out and like draped the couch? It would be a really nice shot, right? And I remember laying in my bedroom and we do this and we've got this wiggly infant kicking the feet around and we're trying to lay, line our feet up just right. And lots of pictures are being taken, and none of them look right at all. Like, it looks terrible. I don't even have a picture to show you because we immediately, I know it's disappointing, we immediately, like, just deleted them because they look so bad. But there was one particular line that struck out, and um, I don't know if she's watching right now, but I think it was my mother-in-law said something along the lines of, 
what's wrong with your feet? Because apparently, not only was the camera skills the problem, but my feet were ruining the picture. Like the feet are all lined up, and my wife has some nice little feet, and then the daughter has some cute little baby feet, and then there's like my feet just kind of ruining the entire aesthetics of the shot. Because I don't really have model feet. You know, like my feet don't look like that guy's feet that were on the picture. There's calluses, and there's things. I don't know. I'm not going to show you my feet, but... It doesn't look like that. I'm not a foot model. And I'm a little embarrassed to talk about it, except for this. I know, I know if we were to like do a foot showing right now, a lot of you too have some really ugly feet, right? A lot of you have some really ugly feet. And because it's, there's all kinds of things that can make your feet ugly, a lot of times our feet are a bit misshapen. They don't look like that perfect foot shape. Uh, a lot of times there's kind of things on it like calluses and warts and just kind of abrasions or like the toenail that's sort of half falling off. In fact, a friend of mine just showed, I don't know why he did this. He sent me a picture of his toenail just yesterday as I was writing this sermon. He sent me a picture. My toenail just fell off. I don't want to see. Anyway, um, and then that's not even getting to like the odor problems of the feet, right? There's all kinds of issues with feet. Most of us, I would venture to say, at least I'm hoping I'm not alone, most of us have some pretty ugly feet, which then allows us to, I think, maybe get to the point of our passage a little bit better. Passage being, of course, John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, this is the beginning of the Last Supper. Um, Jesus is gathering his disciples, and we see this uh, foot washing thing that takes place in John chapter 13, starting with verse 1. It says this, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet dry, drying them with a towel that he had around him. Any of you who have been around an Adventist church for any period of time have probably gone through this practice that we call foot washing, where we take it from this text. You know how, it, you know the drill, right? Like it's communion Sabbath. And on communion Sabbath, before the elements are passed out, there's this period where we all separate to different places and we find this pocket in the church where we have these basins of water and we wash each other's feet. Can I be honest with you for a minute? This, is, this has always been one of my least favorite things that we do. Like, I don't know if you're supposed to say that when you're like part of the church, when you're the pastor of the church, but I've never liked foot washing a lot. And I feel kind of, again, similar to the foot story. I feel comfortable saying this because I also know a lot of you don't like it. Because any church I've ever been a part of, what happens on foot washing Sabbath, the attendance, a lot of you students, you have to be here regardless, but the attendance <clears throat> just plummets every church I've ever been to. So a lot of people obviously feel a little bit awkward about it. And there's lots of reasons why I feel awkward about foot washing. One of which is just simply the, the process of partnering up. Does anyone else kind of identify with this? It feels, it feels a lot like dating, which is weird to talk about, right? Because you're like, we get dismissed and we all kind of start filtering out and then we're supposed to find a partner to wash feet with. And so some of us have like thought ahead of this and we know it's foot washing day and we're like, hey, uh, tomorrow, <laughs> 11 o'clock here at church, you and I, yeah, okay, we're good. And if you're like that, then it's like, really feels like a date. But at least you're covered and you don't have like the social awkwardness of wandering out into that void not knowing who's going to wash your feet. And so if you don't know who's going to wash your feet, you're kind of like meandering out and you're quickly scanning, like looking for the available person who's going to wash your feet with you. Am I the only one like this? Anyway, it's really awkward. And then we get to the point where we actually wash each other's feet. And of course, the process is a bit weird because this isn't something we do in any other context. There's no other context where you're like, hey, can you, uh, can you help me scrub this area a little bit better? Like, could you help me out with my foot here? Like, that doesn't happen. And so it almost feels weirdly intimate as we dip our feet, bare our naked feet, 
ugly feet for some of us, and then someone washes. And then, of course, this part, there's a wide range of experiences because there's a wide range of foot washers. If you've done this enough times, you know that not everyone washes feet the same way. And so you've got the one guy who is the delicate washer. And I don't think they really want to do it. They're trying not to touch your feet while they kind of like, it's more of a sprinkling than a washing. Like they just drip some drops on top of your feet. And then it's over before you know it. You're like, I think my foot's still dry. But they're toweling it off and you're done. But then you have the other person who is like the, the aggressive foot washer. And the aggressive foot washer wants to make sure you know that they mean it. And so when they're washing your feet, they are washing your feet. They take their time. It's almost like a massage. You're like, I don't know if I should enjoy it this much. It's feeling, anyway. Then they like get the towel out and they go between your toes. Like every single toe. There's all kinds of like weird experiences going through the foot washing experience. Now here's the thing that I think we need to understand. That of course, in this story, when Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples... It's not weird in that way. For them, this is a normal thing that you do. It's just kind of normal to have your feet washed when you're going to this group kind of dinner. And of course, we know the reasons why, right? Like one reason is it's a sandal society and they're walking through dusty roads and they're picking up nasty things and so their feet are genuinely dirty. Like usually if you know foot washing is coming, you make sure your toenails are clipped, you make sure that like the toe cheese is out and you try to prep for it well. But these are like genuinely dirty feet And the other thing that we have to kind of like think about is that they're going to eat. And so like typically when you go to eat, it's very common practice to wash your hands before dinner, hopefully. And so you wash your hands before you eat. But here this is a society where they don't have chairs they're sitting on. So they're all kind of reclined, lying around the table. So imagine these nasty, dirty feet. Like if you can kind of picture the way that they're reclined, you're you're going to be pretty close to someone else's foot, right? As you're eating, imagine that. That's going to ruin your appetite pretty fast. Because that's the other issue I have is there's certain shoes of mine that are odor-producing shoes. And this, I know, drives my wife insane. But there's like the moment, you know, some of you have these shoes where it's that one pair, you take it off, and immediately, like, it clears a room, right? And so, like, you don't want that at the dinner table while you're eating. And so you need to wash these feet because they've been exposed all day. And so the typical process, of course, is that they would have their feet washed before they go to dinner. But the weird part in this story is the fact that it's Jesus that's washing. Because typically, of course, this wouldn't be just any person who would wash the feet. It's not like someone just like volunteers to do it. It's a slave or a servant that's going to be responsible for washing all the feet as the guests come in. But in this story, it's different, and that makes it awkward for them. Now, (laughs) the interesting part about this is Ellen White in Desire of Ages, kind of paints a picture of what this looks like. And I just want to read this here. This is from Desire of Ages. It says, The pitcher and the basin and the towel were there in readiness for the feet washing or the foot washing, but no servant was present. All manifested a stoical unconcern, seeming unconscious that there was anything for them to do. By their silence, they refused to humble themselves. I can, I can kind of get this scene. Like you can picture it like this. Awkward scene if they walk in, they're about to have dinner, they know their feet are about to be washed, they look around the room and they see like, oh, well here's a basin, oh, here's a container of some water, somebody should be doing this. Like somebody should be washing their feet, but it's almost like they're pretending they don't even see it. Like they see it, but they're like, ah, that's not going to be my job to do. And you've probably been in this scenario before, right? Like there's some kind of situation, like maybe you're at home with your parents or you're home with your kids and, you know, there's just things that need to get done and you just sort of like sit back assuming somebody else will do it and you just kind of hope and pray like, oh, I don't really want it. This is my least favorite job in the house. I really hope someone else takes it. So you pretend like you don't see it until the job gets done. It's like that. But the question is, why are the disciples doing this? Why don't they just simply jump in? Well, like we said, first of all, there's the cultural element where this has never been their role. If they're going to go to a dinner, there's going to be somebody who's going to be responsible for washing the feet. But of course, the other part here is that at this moment, the disciples are angling for their position in the kingdom of heaven. Because they think the kingdom is about to happen like right now. And they think they are trying to decide like who is the better person? Who is the top dog in this little discipleship clan that we have? 
And so you can see this happening in different parts of the Bible. Um, it comes up kind of regularly throughout the Gospels. But you see, first of all, that this is something that's taking place right there that night. And so in Luke's account of the situation, it says that they begin to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them at this very dinner. Which, by the way, Luke also makes the point, or you see it when you read through Luke, and we talked about this actually a couple weeks ago. But in Luke's account, this happens twice. Once is here at the dinner, and it happens right after Jesus like explicitly says, the Son of Man is about to die. Or, he's, or his time, he's going to be given up to die. The Son of Man is about to be given up to die. And the disciples are like, oh yeah, yeah. By the way, back to this of who's the greatest among us. Which is a pattern for the disciples because this happened in chapter 9 when Jesus gives these little hints like the Son of Man is going to be betrayed soon. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I feel you. Like that sounds really hard. Yeah, like who's the greatest among us? Like they immediately go to that from Jesus talking about his death, right? So this is like a pattern of the disciples. And here this very night, they're having these arguments about who is better than the other person. Who is the supreme leader that's sitting here among us tonight? And why, and like while they're having those thoughts, while they're having those arguments, they walk into this room, they see that basin there, they see the picture there, and they immediately recognize, if I volunteer right now, if I start to serve these other guys that are around me, it'll be so very clear that I'm subservient to their needs. It'll be very clear that they're the leader and I'm the follower, that they're the top dog, I'm the underdog. I'm not going to put myself in that situation. So let's just pretend like I don't even see that thing, and we'll just see who's going to be the submissive one who will go and serve our needs around us. Now, it's easy for us, it's easy for us to dog on the disciples. <laughs> you know, there's so many times where we read through the disciples and we're like, man, these guys... These guys were idiots. I mean, can we say that? Like, is that a, like, like these guys just did not, they were so slow. They, they just weren't catching on. Like, why were they continually doing these things? But the reality is, I think if we're honest, we recognize that most of us are doing the same kind of things. Most of us are kind of angling around with each other in our little social groups, in our uh, work groups, in our peer groups, trying to figure out who is really kind of on top. Like, who is the person that is above? Do I measure up beyond you? And it, and it shows up, like, in all kinds of ways. Like, there's lots of things that we, we do to try to impress, to try to show, to try to give, the, like, this era or era of importance. Um, you know, one, one thing I'm thinking of is, this is kind of related, but AirPods, like, for a while, AirPods were new, and, and, like, the cool people had AirPods, right? And then what did people start doing to, like, show, like, if I, if I can't show that I'm wearing AirPods, like, I might not even be listening to something, but I wear them, just make sure people know I've got them. Like, I'm that person. Uh, but what if you can't afford the AirPods? So what were they doing? They were clipping the wires on the, air, like, the earbuds, regular earbuds, and putting them in their ears, disguising them as AirPods. It was just totally useless, but it, it just shows that we're always looking for a way to angle, to show that we're more important than maybe we actually are, or maybe than we actually feel. And the problem is that even if we're not there to begin with, like even if we're, we don't start off like that, if we start off from a humble perspective, chances are over time we have this way of developing this bad feature where we start to put our needs over other people's needs, where we start to look out for ourselves rather than other people. You know, we, we've been going through this series on leadership, and this is the, the last one where we're saying that, you know, actually in Jesus' world, leadership means service. Like, you have to be in service if you're going to lead. But one of the problems with leadership is that we find that once you start growing in your leadership, once you start rising in different kinds of positions, once you start taking control of some kind of thing, and you start to recognize that you have some kind of influence, the chances are you start gravitating towards a place like the disciples where you're more concerned about yourself than other people. So there's this study, it's a well-known study now from the 90s called the Cookie Monster Study, which is probably the best name for a study ever, right? The Cookie Monster Study. And the reason it was called this is they were kind of trying to figure out how 
power structures influence our social dynamics. And so they would bring this group of people, I think it was about three of them, they were all college students, into a room. They were given this really mundane assignment, having to rewrite the bylaws of the university. And they would bring them in there, and they would leave them alone to, to work on this. They would assign one of the people as the leader. Like, you are the point person, you are the leader of this group, you're in charge of what happens. And then, after they leave them to the, their assignment for a while, they would bring in a plate of cookies, like a little refreshment to just keep them going. But they would always have one more cookie than the number of people that were sitting there. And so everyone would grab their cookie and they would eat their one cookie, but then there was always one left over, which is awkward, right? You've been there, you're sitting around like a family-style meal, and ah, I really want that thing, but do I be that person to grab it? And what they found out is almost without fail, the person who was assigned the position of being the leader of that group would take the cookie. Like They're like, oh, this, I'm the leader of the group, this cookie's mine. And so they would start to eat the cookie. Now, this is what they were expecting. This is what they were trying to see if that would happen. But as they started to watch the video footage of what took place, they realized there was another change in the people as well. The people who ate the cookies stopped using their manners. As in, they started talking with their mouth full. They literally had crumbs spitting out of their mouth, landing on their shirt, landing on the table. They just didn't care anymore about how they were perceived. It was all about them and eating their cookie, and that's why it's called the Cookie Monster Study. And they were like, this is such a bizarre thing. So the guy who led this study, he was talking about like why this takes place. Like why do we change when we start to grab even this insignificant amount of power? And he says this, he says, regions of the frontal lobes are called the empathy network and they help us detect other people's pain. But when you damage that portion of the brain, people can become really impulsive. People who were good citizens of the world after head trauma, they will start swearing, yelling at their kids. Studies have found that if you give people, and here's the link, that was talking about head trauma, but studies have found that if you give people just a little bit of power, they kind of look like those brain trauma patients. With power, you find that you're more likely to flirt inappropriately, to swear at work, more likely to gamble, and kind of lose touch with the other people around you. And he calls this the power paradox, which is basically this idea that when you start off in life, often you're the likable person. Often, if you're going to become a leader, you're the person that's bringing people along, that you're caring about other people, but then as you grow in leadership, you start to care less, and it's more just simply about yourself, and you become less empathetic, less sensitive to what other people are thinking or studying or needing. This is a problem, right? Because the problem is when we talk about the Christian walk and what it means to be a leader. We, we've said before that we are all influencers, which means that to some degree God has all called, it, or called all of us to some type of leadership in our lives. But leadership is about taking care of people around you. Brene Brown in her book, Dare to Lead, she says this, why serve? What does that have to do with leadership? Because, but the, here's the thing, beyond influence, leadership is about the care of the people around us. She says, I define a leader as anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and who has the courage to develop that potential. So here's the question, how do we do it? Like how do we get beyond ourselves so that we actually care about what happens, the people around us? I wanna look at the story and I wanna see a couple of things, first of all, that tell us what not to do. Uh, starting with verse one of John chapter 13, verse one. It says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had, had come to leave this world Returned to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Here's the thing that strikes me about this verse. When it comes to serving people, when it comes to meeting the needs of the world around us, when we see someone who has a struggle, who has something where we realize, you know, that's a void that I could actually fill, we often have reasons that feel like it's the wrong time. We often have reasons that tell us, you know what, I am too busy today, or I am too important for this. Like, this is kind of beneath me. Or, you know, like, 
if I was having a better day, if things were going more my way, I would actually be more selfless and I would help this person. But today is just not the right day. But here in this case, the whole story is set up with a situation where Jesus walks into this room and what does he know? He knows the time that it is. He knows that he's about to go through this thing called the crucifixion. He's already had this panic attack in Gethsemane where he's, where he's about to have the panic attack in Gethsemane where he's you know, completely freaked out about what's before him. Like this is not an easy period of his life. This isn't a moment where it's like, well, I've got nothing better to do than to simply serve people around me. I feel like a lot of times in life, we're waiting for the right kind of moment to do the right thing. We think that the moment for us to act, the moment for us to do the right thing is going to come when life is sort of more settled. When I don't have the exams, when I don't have the stress at work, when I am kind of have my kids at an age where things are kind of taking off better and things are looking a little bit easier. When life is less complicated, at that moment, that's when I'm actually going to roll my sleeves up, get, them dirt, get my hands dirty, and serve the needs of the people around me. But I kind of feel like service is sort of like stewardship with money. Like oftentimes you hear the same kind of message when it comes to giving, that unless you're willing to give when you don't have much, when you only have a little bit of income coming, you won't have the same kind of heart to give later when you have more money. It's not like your heart just magically changes because you have excess. If you were stingy with your money when you had a little bit of money, chances are you're going to be stingy with your money when you have a lot of money. And so the only way to really allow our heart to change is to stop making the excuses and to just simply lean into doing the thing that we feel called to do and not waiting for the perfect opportunity or the right moment when it's easier to do it. The time is now. But the other part of the story that makes it challenging about the excuses that we use when it comes to serving the world around us is verse 2. Verse 2, it says this. It says it was the time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Like, you, we know this, right? Like, we know this story already. But sometimes it's helpful to recognize that in this moment, and you see it later in the chapter, Jesus knows among the people that he's washing feet is the person who's going to betray him. He knows the person who's about to betray him is the very person he's about to serve. Which then tells us, when it comes to serving people, when it comes to seeing people who could use a hand, we don't just simply go for the girl that we're crushing on, right? Like, we don't just simply go for the people that we like. It's the people who are actually actively hurting us sometimes that are the people that are most important for us to take care of. And this goes against every sense of, like, like everything inside of you, every fiber of your body doesn't want to meet these needs. When you know someone doesn't like you, when you know someone's actively working against you, your response wants to hurt them, not help them. But in this case, Jesus sees the betrayer, and he still washes his feet. Which brings us to another account from Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages says this. It says that the constraining power of that love as he's washing the feet of Judas was felt by Judas. When the Savior's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping them with a towel, the heart of Jesus, Judas thrilled through and through with the impulse then and there to confess his sin. Because the thing is that when you actually do something for people, when you're, especially when it's like a, a physical, tangible act, it changes the world. It has an actual impact. I mean, notice what she's saying here. She's saying this moment right here, it almost changed his course. Judas in that moment was so touched by that, sec in that, that fraction of a second, he was ready right there and then to confess the sin because it melted his heart. When we're willing to serve the needs of people around us, it will have an effect on the world around us because it will soften hearts, it will change people. So especially the people that we don't like are the ones that we're actually called to serve. But finally, verse 3. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. And it's in that verse there right after, so he got up from the table. It feels like there's this direct connection from the identity of Jesus to the service of Jesus. 
because Jesus knew who he was, because he knew that it was the Father that had called him, that the Father had given him authority, because he knew that he had authority over the entire world, because of that, he chooses to serve. It kind of feels a little bit backwards from the way that our power structures are typically set up. But for Jesus, the part that freed him to serve was knowing who he was. When you think about it in our lives, oftentimes when we're trying to get ahead of people, when we're trying to impress people, when we're trying to like be the better person, oftentimes it's coming from a place of insecurity. It's coming from a place where we're not really sure if we actually believe we're a better person. We're not sure if we're actually really you know, fit in the place that we're trying to fit into. But the more that we feel that lack of something, the more we try to impress the people around us. The more we try to make it clear that we're up here and you're down here. But when you know who you are, when you know who you've been called by, no longer do you have to work to impress. No longer do you have to work to try to measure yourself with other people because you already know your value. You already know what you have. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament comes from the story of, of Gideon. And I, I love telling, especially like with like elementary kids, this is one of my favorite stories to talk about. Because it's a great story. But the scene that I like most is in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. And it's when we first meet Gideon. And we first see him called by God. In verse 11 it says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the winepress to hide the grain for the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And what I love about this moment is Gideon is not in a place of action yet. He's not in a place of recognizing that he's been called by God or that he's been equipped by God or that he has value by God. And so what he does in response is when there's a threat around him, when there's a problem around him, he lives his life in hiding. He's in this wine press, which is not where you're supposed to thresh grain, apparently. If you've ever threshed grain, you do it somewhere high. He goes low because he's in hiding. But in that moment, God comes to him and he names him what he is. And he says, you are a mighty hero. And it's that naming and that understanding of his identity that then empowers him to go out and take action. And I believe it's the same when it comes to recognizing our role in this world. If you understand who you've been called by, if you understand that God is leading you somewhere and that God sees you as a valuable component in this world, you no longer have to try to measure and instead you can be freed to serve and you can actively work for the betterment of the world around you. Now, I'm going to get to this final verse here. I'm going to jump down to the end. It says this, it says, After washing their feet, he put his robe on again and he sat down and he asked, Do you understand what I was doing. You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet as well. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message, which as I'm reading this, I'm thinking Jesus recognizes this is the end. And he has to be so explicit because his disciples never get it. And so he's making sure it's crystal clear. Here's my example. Let me tell you about the example that I just led you through. Here's what I'm doing. You're not supposed to be like a master because even the master that you're serving acts like a servant. So you should act like a servant as well. You should be willing to go low. You should be willing to humble yourself and do the work that nobody else wants to do. But then he says this, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Or in some versions, you are, blessed are those who do these things. Now the word blessed is kind of one of these words that we throw around in religious circles. You know, bless this, bless that. And sometimes we kind of lose the meaning of what it is. One of the, the actual translations of the word is just simply happy. Happy. Like happy are those who do these things. If you are willing to give up your ego for a moment, if you're willing to actually 
make an impact in the world around you and to serve the needs that you see, if you're willing to, to do the things that nobody else wants to do, if you're willing to stop worrying about your position in society, you will be happy. It just makes your life better. There's a story that was a viral, one of these viral pictures that went out a couple years ago about a flight that was coming in from Portland or into Portland, Oregon. And there was this particular man that was on the flight. His name was Tim Cook. And not the Tim Cook. But this, uh, this man was blind and deaf. And so communication was a real struggle for him. And as he was coming, coming in, like his, his sister was there at the gate and she kind of led him through, did some translations for him. But once he got on the flight, there was nobody left who could communicate for him. And then it became this awkward moment where he would reach out as he would feel someone passing by to ask for something, but he couldn't verbalize what he was trying to ask for. And the flight attendants were kind of feeling at a loss, not knowing what to do. And so at some point they radioed on the, the intercom, is there somebody on the plane who knows sign language? Just someone who could help translate for us. And this young 15-year-old girl raised her hand and came by. I'm going to show you the picture here. Um, now this girl, her name was Clara Daly. And what's interesting about her is that the only reason that she knew a bit of sign language, she started taking it for about a year, was because she was dyslexic. And as she was trying to figure out what kind of language she could take in class, she felt like she would struggle with language. And so she went with sign language. She thought it would be easier. Oftentimes the things that other people see as our weakness will be the thing that's our strength. And so as she goes over to this man, everyone starts to notice. And this one particular passenger snaps this picture because it's just kind of touching. And she says this. She says, it was fascinating to watch as she signed one letter at a time into his hand. He was able to, quote, read her signing and they carried on an animated conversation. When he asked her if she was pretty, she blushed and laughed as the seatmate who had learned a few signs communicated an enthusiastic yes to Tim. She said this, she said, I don't know when I've ever seen so many people rally to take care of another human being. All of us in the immediate rows were laughing and smiling and enjoying his obvious delight in having someone to talk to. What would the world look like if we created these scenes more often? What would the world look like if we were willing to humble ourselves and serve the needs of the people around us? There's a grace when the heart is on fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, and I know I will never be alone, there was another in the fire. Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire.
What may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning? I know I will never be alone. I know. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another. God, thank you for showing us the way when you came here to this earth. Thank you for showing us what it looks like to truly lead and to truly serve. May we follow your heart in the way that we live today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.